So Diane Hunter is our speaker and she's a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma and serves her nation as tribal historical preservation officer. And she works um, out of Fort Wayne and uh, preserves and protects historic sites and resources of significance to the Miami tribe and um, serving more than 800 tribal citizens in Indiana. And she also educates the public about the presence and history of the Miami people. So I will go ahead and turn it over to her and we'll get started. Aya, te pewe ne ala ka koke o wahanungi ka kikwe. Checha kokwa wains riane ni lamitasenia mi amikwea. Seka kweta ne hepalanswa alapakasiane. Hello, I just introduced myself to you in Miamiata Wenge, the Miami language, and I just said, hello, uh, it's good to see all of you here today. My name is Diane Hunter, and I am a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma and a descendant of Sekakweta and Palanzwa, who are also known as the Godfroys. And I am honored to serve my nation as tribal historic preservation officer. What I'd like to do today is to uh, talk about the history of Miamiaki, Miami people, and um, about how my work as tribal historic preservation officer for the Miami tribe of Oklahoma uh, is, is designed to preserve and protect that history and the places where we have lived. The work I do is to protect places most specifically when federal government projects involve ground disturbance. They're going to be digging in the ground. They need to talk to me if they're in areas of interest to us. And so I consult with many, many different federal agencies. Uh, I probably have talked to people in every department in the federal government at some point. But my job is more than just consulting with the government. It's also about increasing knowledge of those important places. I share our history and culture with other Miyamiake, with other Miami people, because as you'll hear, many of us have lost our knowledge of that history. But it's also to share that history with the public, with people like you. So I'm going to talk about our history. And as I talk, I'm going to tell you how my work ties in to that history. So I always find it's best to begin at the beginning. Mitame miamiake nipangonje sakachewe cheke. At first, the Miami came out of the water. Now that's the first line of our oldest story. It's the story of our emergence as Miami people. We don't know where we came from. We believe from some of our other stories that we came from the North, but we don't know exactly where we were. We don't know who we were. But when we came out of the water, we were a unique and different people who came to be called Miamiake or Miami people. Now, this is a map of Miamionge. So you can see generally where our lands were. Keep in mind there were no borders, but when we do maps like this, we have to give some kind of, of outline. So to orient you to this map, you might recognize the name Kikayonge, not spelled the way you know, and probably not quite pronounced the way you've heard people pronounce it, but that red dot is Kikayonge, present day Fort Wayne, Indiana. At the top, the blue dot is Sakiweonge. That's the place where we came out of the water. Now we don't know the exact spot, 
but we know that it was on the St. Joseph River, and no, not the St. Joseph River that we are used to here in Fort Wayne, but the St. Joseph River that goes around South Bend, Indiana, and goes into Lake Michigan. So somewhere between South Bend and Lake Michigan was Saki Weonge, and that's where we came out of the water. Because we don't know these exact places, we don't know exactly where we came from, we pay attention to areas north of present-day Indiana. We pay attention to places all along that St. Joseph River because we don't know exactly where we need to pay attention. Now, we lived in Sakiweonge for some time, and then we began to leave. One of the first places we came to was what came to be called Kikeonge, Fort Wayne later. And we had a number of villages there. But as you can see, most of our villages that we still know about today were along the Wapashiki Sipiwe, the Wabash River. There are other villages but we don't know the names of all of them, and we don't even know where all of them were. But we picked the best places. Most of our villages were at confluences. That's why we liked what's now the Fort Wayne area. It's the confluence of three rivers. But most of those villages that you see on the map were at the confluence of the Wabash River and another river or creek. They were the best places, and we can show that they were the best places because the Americans then built their cities and towns on top of our places. And so those places are of concern to us. We don't know what's beneath the buildings of our cities and towns today. But this entire area, Indiana, Illinois, Western Ohio, and beyond, this is where we have been since time immemorial. So whenever there's a federal project in any of these areas, and it goes beyond what you see on this map here, whenever that happens, we want to consult because we don't know what they're going to find when they start digging in the ground. So we lived in these areas, as I said, since time immemorial, longer than anyone can remember. But in the mid 1600s, there were the beaver wars and we fled from the wars. We did not want to be in the middle of it. So we fled into Illinois and into Wisconsin and further into Michigan. And while we were there, we encountered French tra traders and missionaries at Lake Huron and at Green Bay. So Michigan and Wisconsin are concerns to us today because we were there, we lived there for a period of time. But by the early 1700s, we were back in our homes in what is now Indiana and we were still trading with the French. We enjoyed those trade goods. Um, think about it. Uh, we had always cooked with clay pots. And now in exchange, we got manufactured metal pots. Imagine cooking for your whole life in a clay pot. How many dinners got ruined because you broke the pot? And now you cook with a metal pot. You know, we still cook with metal pots because they cook better than clay pots. So we liked those goods and we continued to trade with the French. And then by the mid 1700s, we were also trading with the British. But then in 1763, there was a Treaty of Paris. And in that treaty, the French ceded to the British all the land that they claimed. Now, that wasn't their land. It was our land. We had not given it, sold it, traded it, ceded it in any way to the French. But now 
they gave it to the British. And 20 years later, there's another Treaty of Paris in 1783. And you're probably aware that 1783, that treaty was the treaty at the end of the American Revolutionary War. And you know what happened to the land then, the British gave it to the Americans. And the Americans saw it as their land. And they came west onto what was still really our land. They came down the Ohio River and north, at that point, pro primarily into uh, Ohio. And we wanted them out. They were illegally on our land. So we attacked them thinking that they would leave. But instead they attacked us. And so we're attacking them, they're attacking us. Skirmishes lead to war. And soon we are at war with not just these individual families, but with the United States. The war finally ended with the Treaty of Greenville in 1795. Now, when you look at this map, you can see the land that we ceded in that treaty. Most of Ohio and some parts of Indiana, primarily where there were forts. As you look at this and, and some other maps that I'm, I show you, it's important to understand that this land was ours. And the maps will help you understand how we lost it. But we were okay with the Treaty of Greenville. It ended the war, it brought us peace. The Americans now had their land, we had our land. We were going to live as good neighbors in peace. But shortly after the treaty was signed, the Americans were coming further in. Now they're coming into Southern Indiana. And the further they come, the more land they want us to cede in treaties. So there's another treaty in 1805 and another one in 1809. Keep in mind, that 1818 is the year that Indiana became a state. When Indiana became a state, clearly not all of Indiana today was part of the state then. Just those green and yellow patches at the bottom were Indiana. The rest of it was still our unceded land. But shortly after that, we ceded more land in the Treaty of 1818. And you can see at that point, we ceded land that within a couple of years was the place where they started the city of Indianapolis as the new capital of Indiana. Then there was another treaty in 1826. And in that treaty, we ceded most of the land north of the Wabash River. We had another treaty in 1834, and again in 1838. Now after the Treaty of 1838, the only, only communal land that we had left was the Great Miami Reserve. That's that white patch in North Central Indiana. Kokomo is in the middle of the Great Miami Reserve. It wasn't there then, but it is there obviously today. We had individual reserves. Some Miami people had their own private reserves, but this was the only land that we had as a tribe. And then probably, well, definitely our most significant treaty was the Treaty of 1840. In that treaty, we agreed to cede the Great Miami, Miami Reserve in exchange for land west of the Mississippi River. Now the United States had been pressuring us for 14 years to exchange our land in what is now Indiana for land west of the Mississippi River. And in this treaty of 1840, we agreed to do it. But more importantly, 
What the United States had also been pressuring us for since 1826 was they wanted us to go to that land west of the Mississippi. And in this treaty, we agreed to be removed. Now, this is an important story for us that I'm going to tell you because it's important for us to understand as Miyamiake, as Miami people, but it's also an important story for others to understand about how we were removed from Indiana and why we are the Miami tribe of Oklahoma today. We have a blog about our forced removal. So if after my talk, you would like to learn more about our forced removal, you can go to this blog post and it's a series of posts that take you through the process that led up to our forced removal and a day by day posting of what was happening when we were on removal. And Kate, if one of you would like to copy that link and put it in the chat, that would be wonderful. Thank you. So I want to tell you how our removal happened. Yes, we agreed in 1840 that we would remove to land west of the Mississippi. But no one wanted to go. Not even the men who signed the treaty wanted to go. And we kept putting it off. We were given five years to remove. We put it off. We can't go this year. We have to harvest our crops. We can't go this year. We own private land. We have to sell our land before we can go. So the five years came and went. And in September of 1846, the U.S. Army arrived at our villages. They rounded us up at gunpoint and they took us to a prison camp in Peru, Indiana. On October 6th, they boarded us onto canal boats at Peru on the Wabash and Erie Canal. We took the canal east, past our homes, past our villages, past Kikayonga, we went into Ohio, and there we went on to the Miami and Erie Canal. And we took that to Cincinnati, where the canal ended. This is a picture of Cincinnati in 1848, less than two years after we were there. Have you ever seen a picture of your great grandmother's house or apartment building? Or, or their farm. Maybe something tragic happened to your family there. Maybe it's a place that was destroyed. If you think about that, it might give you a little bit of an idea what it means to see this picture of Cincinnati. Except this isn't just about my family. It's about my entire nation. It's about when our ancestors were forced to be there. And this is what they saw. They were taken off of the canal boats and brought down to the public landing, which is what you're seeing at the front here. And they were put on the steamboat Colorado, which I imagine looked very much like one of these, probably the one on the right, the less fancy boat, I'm sure, is what they gave us. Now, the Cincinnati newspapers always reported every day what items had come into Cincinnati by boat and what items were leaving Cincinnati by boat. I'd like to share with you what was in the newspaper the day we arrived and left. Daily receipts by the Miami Canal. 134 barrels of whiskey, 218 barrels of flour, 10 sacks of 115 pounds of wool, eight barrels of varnish, 
Miami Indians, 225 over and 78 under eight years old. 49 perch stones, four pigs, and so on and so on. Shipments to St. Louis by the Colorado, 30 tons of dry goods, 32 casts of government stores, 350 Indians with their baggage. It's very clear we were not passengers on these boats. We were cargo. So we boarded the Colorado and we took it from Cincinnati on the Ohio River going west and then north on the Mississippi River. On October 18th, we had our first death. It was an infant. Two days later on October 20th, another death. An elder man named Ottawa. And later that day, we arrived at St. Louis. But they didn't take us into St. Louis. They put us on a sandbar called Bloody Island. And that's where we buried Ottawa and the infant. Now, the Colorado, that steamboat was too large to go on the Missouri River because the Missouri River is very shallow. And they hadn't thought in advance to make arrangements for another boat for us. So we were on Bloody, Bloody Island for three days while they looked for a steamboat that could go on the Missouri River. And after three days, they found the Clermont number two. And so we headed west on the Missouri River. Now the records show that at least two thirds of us were sick while we were on the Missouri River. Think about being on a boat with more than 200 sick people. It was while we were on the Missouri River that there were four more deaths all children. On November 1st, we arrived at the town of Kansas, today's Kansas City, Missouri. And from there, we went overland south 50 miles. It was during this overland journey that a 16-year-old boy died. In early November, we arrived at our new reservation, the Miami Reservation, in what is now Eastern Kansas. It was a hard winter for us. We were sick. We had no houses. They had not prepared any housing for us except tents to live in. By Christmas, the death toll numbered at least 30 people. So 10% of us who had gone on removal had died as a result of that removal, a direct result of that removal. It was a hard winter. But then we began building houses. We started growing crops. We started businesses. We wanted to create a new, a better life for our children. So now as Thippo, as Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, I've got other areas of concern that I have to protect. Eastern Missouri was always an area where we were. Um, the boundary you saw, on that first map was the Mississippi River, but we didn't come to the river and stop. Of course, we came across the river and came a ways into Missouri, but generally not too far. But now we have that route along the Missouri River. We don't know where those four children died or where they're buried, but if they are ever found, we need to know about it and we want to protect them. 
where they are already buried. And if that's not possible, then we want to take them someplace and rebury them where they can be protected. That's what we do with our ancestors. Unfortunately, many of them have been disinterred and not treated respectfully. And so it's part of our, our job to find a way to respect those ancestors and rebury them once again. So now we Miami people have a new reservation in what is Eastern Kansas. And you can see all those pastel pieces. I outlined the Miami reservation, but all those pastel pieces are the reservations of other tribes, mostly tribes who were our neighbors here in Indiana and Ohio. And now they're in our neighbors again in Kansas. The boundaries of our reservation were specifically defined and documented. And we know where our villages were at that point. Now they're in privately owned farm fields, but we know where they are. And you know, building our houses, growing our crops, starting our businesses, life was better. We were building a better life for our children until the Americans came again. American squatters were illegally on our reservation. Kansas was trying to take over our land and tax our land illegally. And in the years leading up to the Civil War, the Missouri bushwhackers were riding across our land into Kansas to fight against the Kansas Jayhawkers to extend slavery into free Kansas. They were riding through our land. There was a battle that was just on the outside northwest corner of our reservation, within five miles of our homes. Those bushwhackers were frightening. Our women were our farmers and they were afraid to go out into the fields because they were afraid that they might be out there when the men came through and they didn't know what would happen to them if that happened. So after the Civil War, the US government realized, you know what, this is really good land after all, and we want it back and we want you to remove. This time they wanted us to remove south to Indian territory. And things were so bad, we agreed to go. And so our tribal government moved to Northeastern Indian Territory, today known as Oklahoma, on the Neosho River. And you can see that little tiny piece of land in the Northeastern corner that's marked Miami, Miami Peoria. Think about the land that we originally saw as ours, Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, and beyond. And then that Kansas reservation, and now this tiny reservation in Northeastern Oklahoma. But this is another place that we have to preserve and protect. It's our contemporary homelands. But that land after we had arrived was allotted, meaning it was given to individual Miami people. And that meant that the reservation no longer belonged to the tribe. And it was as a result of the allotments, that land was eventually sold. And most of our reservation today does not belong to us. So the tribe went west. There were a few families, including mine, who were allowed by treaty or legislation to stay in Indiana. And there was a lot of back and forth, people going from Indiana to Kansas, Indiana to Oklahoma and back and forth. But because of the separation, because of the distance, after the mid 1800s, Indiana and Miami were no longer citizens of the tribe. 
And by our constitution in 1939, we were not allowed to enroll as citizens of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. But in 1996, the tribe voted to amend that constitution so that Indiana, Miami and Kansas, Miami could now enroll in the tribe and we can now all be citizens of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, regardless of where we live, regardless of whether we were part of that removal group or not. And as a result of the 7,000, little more than 7,000 citizens of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, more than a thousand of us live in Indiana today. But the results of that removal is that we are a divided people. We now live all over the United States, although our population centers are Northeastern Oklahoma, Northern Indiana, and Eastern Kansas. But when we're separated like that, Often it would be one family or a small group of families living separate from other Miami people. And we're surrounded by people of another culture. And it's very easy to assimilate to that other culture. And when that happens, our culture begins to go to sleep. And that's what happened with our language. Our last fluent native speakers of our language died in the 1960s. This is also why it's so important to preserve and protect our places and our history. Regaining and reteaching and remembering our history is so important today. And we are in the middle of a cultural revitalization. We call it Imam Wichike, a cultural awakening. Today, the Miami tribe of Oklahoma has our seat of government, as you see in northeastern Oklahoma, in the town of Miami, named after us, of course, in Ottawa County. By our constitution, we are governed by the General Council. And the General Council is every Miami citizen, age 18 and older, who comes to our annual meeting in June and votes. At that meeting, we elect our tribal leadership. And this is our current elected leadership. The gentleman in the center is Douglas Langford. He is our current chief. And these people make decisions on our behalf on a day-to-day -day basis. But at that annual meeting, we tell them what we want done in the next year. That is the Miami way. Miami chiefs, Miami leaders have always been servant leaders. It is their job not to do what they believe, what they want to do. It is their job to serve the will of the people. We are a sovereign nation. And as a sovereign nation, we provide services for our people. We have a police force in, on our reservation, but they have agreements with the town of Miami. And so our police force acts throughout our reservation area, including beyond where the the town of Miami is and throughout Ottawa County. We have tribal courts. We have a preschool. We have services for our elders. Um, we have lunch for our elders. I could have a free lunch, but it's a long way to go to have just for lunch. Um, but our elders who live in Oklahoma can come and receive a free lunch. And we provide a number of social services for our people. We pay for our government and for our services 
through Miami Nation Enterprises. It's our political economic subdivision. And through MNE, we own a diverse portfolio. We own the largest cabinetry, native owned cabinetry company in the United States. We own companies that do contracting, that do software development, electronics utility work, make fences, provide management services, do government contracting. And we have two small casinos in Miami, Oklahoma. Our resources also pay for our cultural revitalization and for our ability to come together and practice our culture. Whenever we get together, whether it's in Oklahoma or Indiana um, or wherever else, we love to stomp dance. This is a traditional dance. Uh, we believe that we were taught it by the Shawnee. Um, in fact, our, our um, name for this dance literally means the Shawnee dance. This is one of the things that went to sleep. But in recent years, the Shawnee have taught it to us again. And so we do this dancing. It's a dance around a fire. Um, you might notice that some of the women have hands tied around their legs. They're called shakers. And there are pebbles in those cans. And as they dance, those pebbles shake. And while the men sing, the women provide the rhythm for the dance. In the wintertime, we have storytelling events. We have a storytelling event in Miami, Oklahoma in the winter. We have one in here in Fort Wayne. And many groups of Miami people, families, will have their own storytelling events in the winter because many of our stories are what we call winter stories. And that means that they can only be told in the winter. And that's defined by in the fall, when the spring peepers, the, cro the frogs, stop croaking and we have a hard frost, then we can start telling these winter stories. And in the spring, when the spring peepers start croaking, and we have the first big thunderstorm, then we lay down that thread of storytelling until the next year. There's a story that explains why we can only tell those stories in the wintertime, but I can't tell it to you. You notice that these storytellers are all young people. It's another effect of our forced removal, another effect of our culture going to sleep. My grandmother remembered sitting at her father's knee with other children, listening to him tell stories. But my father never heard those stories. And I was quite old before I heard the stories. And so now our young people are learning the stories that we did not learn when we were young. And they're telling the stories to us. But as we know, one day those young people are going to be elders. They are going to be the people who should be telling the stories. And they will pass those stories on to their children and grandchildren. And all will be right again. So I said our language went to sleep in the 1960s when our last fluent speakers died. But in the 1990s, we began a language revitalization. And we are teaching our language to our children and to our people. Some of these storytellers are able to tell the stories in Miami Atawenge in the Miami language. We have an online language dictionary and it has sound bites so that we can, can hear what this word is supposed to sound like. We also have a language learning app, which again helps us learn how to say those words. 
We have camp in the summer for our children. We have one week in Oklahoma and then we repeat the week here in Fort Wayne. And at that camp, our children learn how to, they learn about our history, they learn about our language, they learn about all the different aspects of our culture. But most of all, that top picture shows you what they really are there to learn for. They are there to learn how they are connected as Miamiake, as Miami people. And as they grow up, they will know my, more Miami children. And they will come to our gatherings in Oklahoma and here in Fort Wayne, and they will see friends that they would not have known otherwise. And as adults, when they go to vote, they will see friends that they have known since they were young children who are their relatives as Miamiake. Now we love to play games. We have been playing games since time immemorial. When we first encountered the French, when they first appeared, they recorded much about us and they talked about us playing games. In fact, one of the French traders wrote that we take such delight in our games that we will forego eating and sleeping to play or even to watch a game. Sound familiar? Well, today we figure out how to eat while we watch our games, but it's nothing new. We've been engaged in our games since time immemorial. And one of the games, the game specifically that the French trader was referring to is Peketaha Menge. Maybe you'll recognize it as lacrosse. But we play lacrosse, Peketaha Menge, in our traditional way. We play with traditional sticks. My colleague makes these sticks for us to play with. Um, they're different. If you know anything about lacrosse, modern day sticks look quite different. We play by, well, no, it's not true that we play by different rules. Modern lacrosse players play by rules. We don't. We just get out there and we play. The French trader noted that we played, men and women both played lacrosse. That's not true for, for all uh, tribal communities, but in ours, women as well as the men played. Today we play men and women, boys and girls, all ages. Last summer we had a lacrosse game at our annual gathering. The youngest player was three years old. The oldest player was 83. And we love to play. Other games that we play, now I should tell you about Peketaha Menge, however, it's a summer game. We only start playing Peketaha Menge when the spring peepers start croaking and we have the big thunderstorms. When we lay down the thread of storytelling, we pick up our lacrosse sticks and we play until the fall when the spring peepers stop croaking and we have the first hard frost, we lay down the lacrosse sticks, pick up the thread of storytelling. But we have games that we do play all year round. Senzuwinge is a bowl game. Um, it's a, a dice game. And so you toss those dice in the bowl and how they fall determines what points you get. I will tell you, I don't know why we took this picture because that person got Mucha kiku, they got no points. We should have at least showed an example of getting points. But that's the way the game goes. Sometimes nobody gets points. Sometimes people win on their first turn. So it's a fun game that we play all year round and have been playing since time immemorial. The other game uh, is the moccasin game. It was originally played with moccasins. And uh, those pads 
on the on the blanket there. Um, we use those pads now instead of moccasins, but it's a hide the pebble game. So you hide the pebbles under the bat, and then the other team has to figure out where it is. And so the team, the, the girl with her back to you, she hit it, and the other team's trying to find it. But the girl's team is singing because they're trying to confuse and distract the other team from finding the pebble. We love to play this game. We play all year round, and we have moccasin tournaments. We love to play these games. We so delight in our games. We also have a Miamia art called ribbon work. Now, ribbon work is um, done by many Great Lakes tribes. It's not uniquely Miami. But the Potawatomi, for example, do a lot of floral designs. And each tribe does a variety of designs. But we Miami people, all our ribbon work is done in diamond patterns. And we sew this. We take silk ribbons that we got in trade and we cut and fold the ribbons and then we sew them in layers to create the patterns that you see. Now we are learning to do ribbon work, to sew ribbon work again. In fact, um, you can see from the image, it's not just women who do ribbon work today. Um, even our young people and our, even our, our men are learning to sew ribbon work. But it's very, very time consuming. The tiny, tiny stitches that are required take good eyes and a long time. So we still use our ribbon work designs just as our ancestors took silk ribbons to make diamond patterns. Diamond patterns have been around for a long time in tattoos, in art, on hides. They use the new technology of ribbons to make these patterns. So today we use modern technology to imprint those patterns on our t-shirts. Um, one person put it on the back of his cell phone case. Um, as you can see, I put them on my PowerPoint slides. But when you see these kinds of diamond patterns, and there are many, many different designs, but all diamonds, when you see those designs, you recognize a Miami person. So thinking back, what is my role as Tribal Historic Preservation Officer? Let me give you a little history of that. In the 1950s, you may remember or may have read that they were doing a lot of construction in the United States. They were building the interstate highway system. They were building dams. And in the process, they were destroying many, many sites of historic importance. Not just sites important to tribes, but sites important to all Americans. And so in 1966, Congress passed the National Historic Preservation Act to preserve and protect historic places. And section 106, of the National Historic Preservation Act provides each state to have a state historic preservation officer and each tribe that wants to can have a tribal historic preservation officer. In the Miami tribe, we have had our thipo since 2010. But my job as thipo is not to stop projects. My job is to protect resources. I want those highways to be built. I drive my car. I want to have good highways. And I want to have safe highways. I use my cell phone. I want them to build the cell towers. 
but I want them to do it in ways that do not damage or destroy places of historic or cultural importance to us. Now, most projects have no impact. Still, the federal agencies have to consult with tribes in the areas of their interest, of their historic uh, and cultural uh, interest on any federal undertaking that falls under Section 106, and most specifically, any project with ground disturbance. And they particularly need to consult if archaeology has shown that there are places of archaeological archaeological sites, or if the tribes tell them, we know this was an important place for us. We know this is where we were. But even then, sometimes projects encounter sites that no one knew about. And so then they consult with us. This is what we found. What do we do? And together, we make decisions. The final decision is the federal agencies, but they do it in consultation with the tribes. Sometimes they encounter our ancestors. And so we work closely to protect those ancestors and to see that they are reburied. When it's on federal land or when those ancestors are already in a museum, then it falls under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, which gives tribes rights to repatriate those ancestors and anything that was buried with them. But this only applies to federally recognized tribes. And that has to do with our sovereignty. Federal recognition means the U.S. recognizes the tribe as a sovereign nation. They recognized us as a sovereign nation when they made treaties with us. You don't make treaties with anyone other than another nation. And so we are sovereign nations. And when we consult with these federal agencies, it is government to government consultation. Any interested organization can consult on a project, but not as a tribe. That is a very distinctive and specific kind of consultation. So why is it important? Why does it matter to us? Each of our tribes has our own history and our culture that are different from each other. Um, I was just in a meeting earlier today with other tribes, and it's it just as a reminder how different we are. Not just our language, but our culture and our history and our beliefs. We are all different. And so it's important to protect that, to protect our ancestors, our places, and our ancestors' objects that they've left behind. It's a matter of showing honor for those ancestors and showing respect for tribal beliefs and practices. It's about protecting those places where we were and the places where our ancestors still are. So my work as Thipo is about our identity as Miyamiaki, who we are as a people. It's about our way of life, our unique perspective. It's tied to our language, our stories, our culture, our history. And most importantly, it's about leaving what we have relearned revitalized, remembered, leaving all of that for the generations to come. Mishinewe, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so we do have some questions. 
And I just wanted to mention um, first, if anyone has questions after the program, or if you would like a copy of the chat from today's Zoom, you can email us at genealogy at acpl.info, and we'll stick that in the chat. And so our first question for you is, um, someone asks, my paternal grandfather was born on the Godfrey Reserve, Reserve in 1891, and where can I find more information on the reservation at that time? Oh, <laughs> that takes quite a bit of research, actually. It's not something um, very simple. Um, but I might have information for you. Um, if you want, you, I took it down, but if you got my email up there, it's dhunter at miamination.com. If you want to e email me, I can uh, and tell me the names and I can see what I can, can find out for you. Sounds good. Thank you. And then our, for our next question, um, person mentioned that um, they read the books, um, The Other Trail of Tears by Mary Stockwell and the book Native Americans of East Central Indiana by Chris Fluke, and was wondering if you have recommendations for other Miami specific books or um, any other reference material for further Unfor reading. Unfortunately, there aren't good books about Miami people. There just aren't. Um, there are a couple of books um, that have been written about Miami people. Um, the better one um, was written 50 years ago in 1970 um, by Bert Anson. Uh, the Miami Indians is the title. Um, that was written at, at, the, at a time when ethnohistory was just becoming, um, was just beginning to be done. Um, for the time period, he did a good job. And for the most part, his facts are pretty good, but he doesn't, he doesn't know how to interpret it. He doesn't know how to explain what's going on. So you have the facts, but you don't have um, an understanding of what it, what it means. Um, the best source for us right now is that blog. And I should have just, let me put that back up. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, the, the bottom link there, um, you might want to do a screenshot because it is obviously a very difficult word to uh, uh, copy. But also if you just Google Miamia, M-Y-A-A-M-I-A, Miamia community blog, you should be able to find it as well. Um, that's the place um, that has the, the information about our forced removal, but there are a number of articles about our history um, that you will find uh, useful. Um, but right now, um, we just don't have, there are not good books. Um, unfortunately, um, there are a few that are, are um, uh, more specific. Um, Carter's book about uh, Little Turtle is, fairly good. Um, it's generally recommended. Um, but um, most of them haven't delved into the primary source material um, and are based on secondary sources. And a lot of what was written about us in the late 1800s, early 1900s was just not accurate. And we mm -hmm. can we can see that today. Sounds good. Um, and jumping off of that a little bit, are there any um, specific resources on the Miami Tribes website where people um, that you recommend people visiting to learn more about the tribe and the heritage? Um, there is, um, there's a page on the About Us page. If you go to MiamiNation.com, which is also on this page here, um, uh, there's a, yeah, the About Us gives kind of an overview of our history. Um, uh, and um, our newspaper is there. So if you want to know things that have happened in, in the last mm, 20 years, um, some of the, not all of the newspapers are there, but some of them are there. So um, you can see, uh, we just, our latest newspaper came in the mail 
um, yesterday. So um, uh, if you want to see what's happening in the Miami tribe today, you can see the latest, the latest issue of our newspaper. Um, but yeah, you can explore the, the, the website to see mostly, it's mostly though about our tribe today. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Um, so I think that'll finish us up for today. And again, um, if anyone has any questions after the program, or if you'd like a copy of the chat, um, please send us an email at genealogy at acpl.info. And um, thank you for a great presentation, and I hope everyone has a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.